at episode 142, featuring a long overdue retrospective of the great post-apocalyptic RPG, Wasteland. Released in 1988, this game, of course, inspired the Fallout series and will probably continue to inspire any sort of post-apocalyptic uh, RPG to come after it. As a matter of fact, Brian Fargo has recently put together a Kickstarter project that has raised over a million dollars to fund the sequel, the official sequel to this game. So I thought it was time that we had a closer look at it. Now, it's a very complicated game with a whole lot to it. So without further ado, here is Wasteland. And here we go with Wasteland. This is the classic, the seminal, the foundational post-apocalyptic RPG released in 1988 and written by Alan Pavlish with a PC version by Michael Quarles, which you're seeing here. It's an utterly fantastic game. It was, of course, the inspiration for the Fallout games. Although, let me say, I think there's as much difference between Wasteland and Fallout as there is between Fallout and Fallout 3, if you even count that last game as part of the franchise. Now, there's a lot going on here. Uh, most of it is not actually spelled out in the game itself. As you'll see, there's a lot uh, that's printed in the manual. So you'll want to get a copy. You can get a box copy of the original. Or you can get the Interplay's 10-year anthology classic collection, probably easier to get a hold of. And that has a big book in it uh, that includes this manual and more. For one thing, look at all of those stats. Uh, we have to create up to four characters. You can play it with fewer, but I don't know <laughs> I don't know why. I guess if you like a challenge. Uh, we have strength, IQ, luck, speed, agility, dexterity, charisma, and skill points. Now what, you ask, is the difference between speed, agility, and dexterity? Those are usually just subsumed in one. Agility, according to the manual here, is how deftly you move. Uh, the higher the value, the better you'll perform in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Dexterity is also important in combat and extremely useful in mastering the, quote, thiefly arts, so picking locks or aiming weapons, which will be very important in this game. Uh, then we also have speed. That's described in the manual simply as how fast you move. Uh, not very helpful. Uh, what it actually seems to do is affect the order of attacks in combat and also helping you escape the odd trap or two. So also very useful. A lot of these monsters hit hard, so it's good if you can kill them before they get their attacks in. Luck is also a lot more important in this game than in other games. A lot of times uh, luck is just there kind of as a wild card. Uh, here it's actually checked uh, quite often. It uh, lets you hit if you're in uh, close combat and does more damage in ranged combat, so it's pretty critical. So basically all of these stats are critical. Uh, I haven't even mentioned IQ yet, which is probably the most critical, according to most of the guides and walkthroughs I've looked at. IQ determines how many skill points you get, and you need uh, quite a bit of skills in this game. Um, especially later in the game, you have to have a lot of IQ to, to learn uh, some uh, necessary skills. You don't have to worry about right away, but it's something you need to be working towards even here at the beginning. Uh, fortunately, as you level up, you'll be able to raise these skills, but it's good to know what you're getting into. Now, the initial skills that you can learn, there's quite a few skills in this game that are actually useless, and some of that are next to useless. Some that you really only need one character in your party to have, and others that are absolutely essential for everybody, though depending on your play style. Now, I've tried to remember as I played this that back in the day, uh, the only thing people would have had access to was the manual. And of course, it doesn't spell out which of these skills are absolutely essential and which are absolutely worthless, kind of like a college curriculum. And there was no internet for you to get on and, and look at a wiki and see what other people have recommended. And you couldn't even bitch about the ending if you even got there, because nobody would give a damn. That said, I'm quite happy to look at a wiki now <laughs> and see what they recommend. Plenty of uh, very detailed walkthroughs you can look at if you're uh, so inclined. I wouldn't recommend that, but you can at least see what the skills are. So the skills that every character should have according to this walkthrough are Brawling, Climb, Swim, Perception, Assault Rifle, AT Weapon, Energy Weapon. You need at least two characters with Medic and Doctor. And uh, at least one character will need Pick Locks, Silent Moves, Demolitions, Bomb Disarm, Safe Crack, Helicopter Pilot, Toaster Repair, Electronics, and Clone Tech. Uh, now, some of those skills, you, they're not even an option at this point. Uh, you'll get them later on. I should also mention that these skills are tied to those stats that I mentioned earlier. For example, to be a good brawler, you need lots of luck. 
to be good with an assault rifle, you need lots of dexterity. To be a good, to perceive uh, well, you need a high IQ. So everything is uh, tied together here quite nicely. You probably also noticed that it costs more points to raise them uh, above level one. The higher the level, the more points. So this is a very ahead of its time system that would be adapted, modified in many later games. Curiously, the choice of nationality doesn't seem to have any effect on the gameplay. That's kind of interesting given the story. Uh, you're basically the modern equivalent, the post-apocalyptic equivalent of the Texas or Arizona Rangers. Uh, a, a Corps of U.S. Army engineers was somewhere out in the desert when the, after, you know, when the bombs dropped, the event happened. Uh, they took over a prison, expelled all the prisoners, and set up a colony. Uh, they've gathered up some of the quote, local survivalist communities. I guess Discovery Channel was out here filming Man vs. Wild and Survivor Man. <laughs> I don't know. All right, taking a look here at my characters. Uh, everything seems pretty good, although I've uh, got myself on the wrong side of the Ranger Center. Now, you can see this is a, a top-down tile-based map similar to the Ultima series. You definitely didn't see anything like this in the Bard's Tale, uh, so it's kind of interesting to see it here. They've actually uh, innovated quite a lot on that Bard's Tale engine. There's quite a few differences I'll, I'll try to talk about through the course of the video. Uh, this is the first little village I can encounter, and you can see it's telling me, uh, giving me uh, some descriptions of what I see. Um, these are apparently dorms. I assume a lot of the people who played this might very well have played it in a dorm, so perhaps that's a little commentary there from Mr. Pavlish. This is... You can see the, the view changes slightly when you go into a building. Uh, here we have a note uh, with lots of clues. You'll want to keep a notepad handy if you're not playing with a walkthrough to write these things down because uh, later you'll need them for uh, to uh, converse with people. It's a keyword system. Uh, here's a little place where I can buy something if I had money, but unfortunately <laughs> I have no cash at this point. Although if I were smart, I could sell some of the junk in my inventory. Uh, you don't need a hand mirror, uh, for example. So you can sell a few things. Basically, what you want to do is, uh, as soon as possible is get some better armor and some better weapons. I can do some other stuff here, though. Uh, here's a locked door, so guess what? I can use that awesome pick lock skill. Uh, what I like about this game, too, is if you are having trouble picking the lock, you can just try to bash it open with a sledgehammer. See there, I've managed to piss off these juvies. Had to fight them in a moment. Uh, there's some notes about some rail nomads, sneak attack plans. All of this sounds uh, pretty important. Hydrophobia, a cave across a creek. So, you know, this game is doing a pretty good job of uh, building up and letting me know that there's something over there that I need to investigate. Uh, this is uh, much different, though, than the uh, modern game, which would have, I guess, big question marks and waypoints and basically a giant arrow pointing to the place you're supposed to go next. Uh, back then, they actually expected you to take notes and figure stuff out, use trial and error, uh, perhaps uh, make a friend <laughs> and compare notes with him. Okay, here we are in a little a little hut or shack, I guess. You can see that there's clues at the bottom. It says this is a big contraption. Not sure what it is, so I can try to use my perception skill uh, to figure out what it is. So it says that it's a water purification device. It looks broken. Hmm, now why does that sound so familiar? All right, I'm looking here, don't see anything else. Got me some jewelry uh, that I can sell. Uh, now I got this uh, little doctor's office here. <laughs> that doesn't exactly inspire much confidence. Actually, uh, you can use, you can pay uh, five coins uh, per point to heal, uh, but I don't know why you do that when you can easily just uh, hit escape a bunch of times and heal that way. All right, here's the kid, so I can start to ask him about the things I saw in that note about the dog. Don't kill my dog, Rex. Sorry, kid, that's why <laughs> I want to do nothing more at the moment than to kill your dog and advance the story. This kind of game would never fly today. I mean, they've got you killing dogs. they got you killing bunny rabbits. They've even got you killing babies. <laughs> this is some sadistic stuff. I kid you not, you're going to be probably either disgusted or find it hilarious. Uh, we shall see. So I'm looking around for this uh, hole he mentioned, this cave. I have to use uh, my perception skill. Now, it's a bit of a pain to have to go through these menus, and there is a macro system, if you can believe it. 
I uh, didn't bother to, to figure it out, but apparently it's uh, quite useful if you intend to play all the way through the game, especially uh, learn how to use that. And I just hit F1, for example, and that would enter 50 escapes. All right, so I'm down here in the cave looking for the kid's dog. I don't know if I've mentioned yet that you can use all sorts of items. You can use a match, for example, and see things in these caves that you can't otherwise see. Let's see, we have a very dark cave here. The floor is rocky. Uh, there's the rope that I used to get down here. Now, coming up will be the chance I've been waiting to use my climbing skill. So, unfortunately, it doesn't work too well if... Uh, you know, at this uh, at this level, so if you don't do it right, if you fail to check, basically, you take some damage. You may have to repeat this uh, several times uh, uh, to get over the, the thing. But, uh, on the other hand, you can do it as many times as you want. So if you want to raise that skill, just uh, keep going. All right, this is a spiked mutt. It would have been a rabid dog if I hadn't used the match. I gotta say, though, this guy doesn't look like Lassie. <laughs> I think he wants to eat Timmy. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to hit him over the head with a crowbar. Yeah, I'm guessing uh, PETA would not like this at all. Good old Cherry 2000 finished, the, <laughs> finished him off. <laughs> all right, looting. Now, you can only hold uh, so many items, and sometimes you come across a critical quest item, and if you don't have room, uh, you're screwed. So that's another little problem you always have to be thinking about. Uh, the save game system is, is interesting, too. Uh, if you if all your party dies, uh, you can create new characters, but whatever you've done in the world will still be there. So, for example, if you've already done this uh, Rex quest, it'll it'll be done. So, if you create a new party and come back here, um, this will you won't be able to do it again. Uh, you have to actually download a little program to reset everything if you uh, want to. I think that's kind of an interesting way to do it, though. Sort of gives you the idea of a persistent world, and you're just creating more and more rangers to go out and, you know, finish the job. Oh, here's a juvenile. Now, you'll notice I have an option there to hire instead of attacking him. And if I hire him, he becomes, or is it she? <laughs> kind of hard to tell from that picture. Uh, but I've got Jackie in the party, a female, U.S. Uh, not very good stats. I guess this is supposed to be a, a little kid. Or maybe a pregnant woman, I couldn't really tell. But it's an extra dog-whacking crowbar to add to the party. Always a welcome addition. Actually, she's got a crummy knife. I'm trying to swap that out as soon as I can. Uh, the There's nothing in the manual about the damage that these various weapons do. You'll have to go to a uh, one of the wikis for that. Clubs and axes do more damage than these crowbars do. Need to try to get some as soon as I can. Just kind of uh, exploring the rest of this cave, uh, working on my climbing skill. Uh, but let's uh, get on out of here and see what's outside. You know, apparently this is some kind of summer camp uh, for teenagers. Kind of an interesting location to have uh, as your first your first town, really. Uh, a lot of playground equipment, slides, that sort of thing. Kind of creepy if you think about it. Oh, and here's Bobby. He's uh, kind of mad at me for killing his dog. I guess I can't blame him. You know, he looks a lot like Jackie, doesn't he? Okay, uh, this is kind of irritating here. I don't have uh, ranged weapons equipped, uh, so I've got to just keep running at him and going through this uh, cycle over and over again. Uh, this can get really irritating if you're trying to run away from an enemy, uh, as you can imagine. But it's at the same time, it's kind of neat that at least you do have that uh, map view that you can look at and uh, position yourself. So sometimes you get attacked by multiple enemies coming in different directions. Uh, so you uh, have some more. Uh, you have an additional strategic component that you didn't have uh, with Bard's Tale. Well, let's leave that town and head on to the agricultural center. Now you notice that in a minute it's going to tell me to read paragraph 56, and that's of course referring to the manual. It's a pretty lengthy paragraph, so I won't read the whole thing to you. But it's all about these. Um, impossible to kill varmints. And there's number 84. Paragraph 84 is uh, actually several paragraphs, and that's about the uh, watch out for Harry the Bunny Master. Apparently this town is having some trouble of an Elmer Fudd variety. And you can see that from the type of creatures, and look what I get to kill now! <laughs> oh, yeah! <laughs> oh, bring on the rats, baby. Man, they kept me waiting for a while, but here they are. And I got three whole troops of them. Yeah, I mean, I'm loving this. 
Okay, I got, I'm a little I'm a little too excited about these rants to be uh, reading this this passage to you, but uh, it's they're really well written and they remind me very much of the type of things a a good dungeon master would say uh, during the course of a Dungeons and Dragons game. You got the characters here and their dialogue. Um, I actually have to say I actually prefer this to just cut scenes. I definitely like it better than just reading text on the screen. Now I was thinking earlier that uh, this system basically served three purposes. Uh, one is it let them have a lot more story than they had they could put in the game because they didn't have to use the, the memory, very limited memory to store all this text. Uh, secondly, it uh, kept you from having to read the text on a screen, and so you got a little bit more bang for your buck. Got a nice, uh, highly, at least uh, this interplay book I've got here. It's very nicely produced. It's a very readable text. Uh, thirdly, it's a form of copy protection. You know, a lot of people would copy the discs and spread them around to their friends at uh, user groups and so on. But it, it was a lot more uh, work-intensive and costly to actually copy a bunch of pages of a manual. Uh, so it served all those purposes. And um, a lot of these uh, journal entries are contain valuable clues. And some of them are fake. Uh, fake entries there just to uh, trick people who just read them out of order. Uh, so all in all, I really like that. Uh, Pool of Radiance has the same uh, system, which is kind of interesting, uh, considering they both came out in 88. And looks like we've got Harry the Bunny Master here. <laughs> I don't know if this is some kind of inside joke uh, with Pavlish and Fargo. Uh, this guy actually packs a pretty good punch. Uh, he's uh, killed the uh, first party I had in here. So I'm really hoping this time to to get him. Gotta love those verbs. Brutalizes. Hammers. If you go way over their, their health when you kill them, sometimes you'll get a special message like... Pound them into blood sausage. <laughs> I love that one. I <laughs> see one of my a couple of my guys are unconscious. Uh, that's not really that uh, huge of a deal. Uh, they'll come back on their own if I can just keep them from being uh, keep my whole party from dying. Uh, sometimes they will. Go, but the worst uh, after unconscious is of course serious, and then critical. And at those points, you have to bring in your medics um, to bring them back to unconscious to get them back on the road to recovery. And then you'll probably need to hit escape about 100,000 times to get him back up to snuff. This guy is, uh, okay, got uh, Harry's down. Now I just have to deal with this bunny. You know, he looks kind of like a rat to me. Okay, so there we go. I have slaughtered the Harry <laughs> and the bunny. Now uh, murdering the cute little animals has rescued their major food supply. See, so it was all it was all for the common good. All the slaughtering <laughs> of cute little animals. <laughs> oh, oh man, this would never fly today. Now, the way that you heal in this game is you just wait. Uh, you just keep hitting escape. Uh, sometimes uh, when you're doing that, you'll be attacked by a random encounter, such as uh, this opossum here. But it's no big deal. Uh, you can go outside, actually, outside of a town, and the time will pass faster, uh, so you can heal faster. You can also, if you want to rest safely, you can do so in certain parts of a town. Or apparently you can go out in the desert. As long as your guys have canteens, uh, you'll be uh, safe to rest there and heal back up. So, you know, like I said, not, not too big of a deal. As long as you don't come across any really nasty monsters, you should be okay. So I was able to buy a new engine for this water purification system, so I came back to put it in. Got some nice uh, rewards for this. Look at that. Four leather jackets. and That's armor. Got some clips, some jewelry. Got a lot of uh, good stuff from there. Of course, you can go to the different towns and use the money to buy better weapons, <laughs> which I'll do in a, in a moment here. Uh, but I wanted to show you what this uh, leveling up process looks like. It's quite, quite gratifying. Ah, that's always such a lovely sound after all that grinding. I get some points to distribute among my attributes, as well as some additional hit points. All good stuff. By the way, the way that you get more skill points is by raising IQ. You see they're the same stat there. Now, it's recommended by the guidebooks I looked that you try to get that all the way up to 23. Of course, you'll also want to have a high luck and a max con. Very nice stats to have. You know, this setup reminds me a lot of the review board in The Bard's Tale, but as you remember in that game, you had to actually find them and, keep, and go all the way to their headquarters 
every time you wanted to level. Uh, this, you just hit the radio button and you can call them up anytime. It doesn't cost you anything. So it's quite a nice little, little setup there. So this is a good bit later in the game. I've encountered a prostitute, but she won't uh, take the whole party at once. I have to disband one of my guys. And it's actually a really cool feature of this game uh, that you can separate out your party members and have them act independently. Unfortunately, I spent $50 on this, and I didn't even get to see any 8-bit nudity or anything. And actually seems to have contracted a STD. <laughs> Look at my uh, my uh, Maxcon is, is highlighted. So, yeah, I'm uh, going to have to go to a doctor about this. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh, poor Vic. Oh, poor, poor Vic. Did I mention this game is not really appropriate for anybody? <laughs> okay. So we are inside a some kind of uh, ruined structure. You know, again, they, they didn't have a lot of uh, graphics to work with, but uh, that's why they have all these great verbal descriptions and journal entries and things. So this is, if you actually bother to look at it, look at it it's kind of creepy. You know, you've got corpses and debris everywhere. Um, there's very effective, I think, descriptions, you know, especially for the time. Uh, this is something that would really make you use your imagination. And if you could try to picture yourself um, in this world, having these things happen to you. <laughs> oh, my God, it's a leather jerk. <laughs> that sounds kind of kinky. Oh, man, what is the matter with that guy? Oh, there's another one. <laughs> oh, these jerks are everywhere. All right, thankfully... Uh, they go down. Maybe I shouldn't use that turn of phrase. Uh, fortunately, they are easily dispatched. There we go. Let's go with that. You notice I'm getting uh, plenty of attacks now, doing a lot more damage now that I have axes and clubs. That actually takes advantage of my brawling skill, unlike the crowbars. Let's see what else is here. A lot of uh, stuff to do. Uh-oh. <laughs> jerks. <laughs> These are just flat-out jerks. They're not even leather jerks. Man, look at that jerk! That jerk! You know, there's just something satisfying about killing flat-out jerks. I mean, you, you know, you have no no remorse about this whatsoever. That jerk has no problem that a blow to the head with a giant axe won't solve. That's my kind of game. All right, what do we got here? A password? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> right, look at that. Blow off. I guess they couldn't just just couldn't quite bring themselves to to say f off, f off. See, it's easy. I I can do that. I f off, f off, jerks. Go back to your tanning bed. And you stay there. Damn leather jerks. Okay, moving uh, right along here. <laughs> There's the hooker again. <laughs> well, why don't we uh, skip ahead a bit here and see what else we can find? Damn again. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Just hope these guys never decide to form a circle. All right, let's get the hell out of here. Well, Vic kept going on and on about the strange bumps on his you-know-what, so decided to come back here to High Pool and visit the friendly neighborhood <laughs> doctor. <laughs> Would you let that guy anywhere close to your vital bits? Oh, Wasteland Herpes. <laughs> Oh, please, please let him keep this in Wasteland, too. <laughs> Only 50 bucks. You know, there's there's a lot to this game. I mean, I love the humor. There's a lot of uh, wacky stuff in here, but there's also a lot of dark, very dark, grim humor, if you will. Black humor, I think is the technical word. A lot of this, of course, you know, shows up in Fallout, but not quite as raw, I think, as in a Wasteland. So I'm very curious uh, with Wasteland 2 what kind of tone that game will, will set. Hopefully they won't clean it up too much and keep some of this sort of gritty, politically incorrect stuff in here. I think that's what makes it appealing, really. Since they're not beholden to a publisher, I think they would be pretty free to do whatever the hell they wanted. So I know you wanted to see me kill some babies. I mean, who wouldn't? Any man who kills puppies and babies can't be all bad. I... I'm pretty sure Oscar Wilde said something like that at one point. Now here is a a clan. They've invited me in, but as you can see here, they have decided to attack in mass. I had to fight the entire Topeka clan. Six men, six women, two children, two elders, 
And yes, there are even some toddlers <laughs> crawling up to me, I guess, with some kind of blade in hand. Maybe they're going to bite my ankles off. I don't know. Well, here we go. This, this is a pretty serious battle. Uh, but at this point, I'm pretty well armed. I don't have uh, the best armor uh, yet, but uh, more, than, uh, more than enough to kill these. Now, you know, I don't know if I've mentioned this, but there's numbers sometimes after the enemy's names, like 14 feet, 10 feet. And that... Uh, tells you what kind of weapon you'll need to reach them or whether you'll need to run towards them. I per I've actually uh, come to prefer the melee attack, so I just try to get up close to them and do a lot more damage that way, but I guess later on if you had rifles or some type of uh, AT weapons, you could attack from a, from a distance. I think that's absolutely necessary later in the game when you're fighting much more powerful opponents. But these guys will go down quick. One baby Topeka appears at 40 feet. <laughs> oh. oh, man. You know, it's it's not even like clubbing baby seals anymore. I'm actually clubbing babies, <laughs> literally. <laughs> oh, I just, you know, I, I'm even 1988, I'm surprised that they, they, they got away with this. And I've never really heard uh, any kind of outrage uh, about this game you know you think there would be have been somebody somewhere that would have said are you guys insane <laughs> but, you know i guess they got away with it uh, i just wanted to you know just to talk about the changing times just a little quote from emil paglarulo uh, fallout 3's lead designer this question of killing kids came up and he said uh they were thinking about having it so you could blow kids heads off and he said quote but then we began to think Really, what benefit would there be in killing kids in the game? It just seems gratuitous, unnecessary, and cruel. Well, I would agree that it is gratuitous. It is, I guess, unnecessary. Cruel, perhaps. But, uh, Mr. Pagliarulo, there's a big difference between Disneyland and wasteland. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with the first part of a wonderful interview with the Fat Man, aka George Sanger, one of the greatest game musicians of all time, and he's got a great personality and he, and he tells really good stories, so you definitely want to stay tuned for that. As always, I want to thank you if you have donated to the show. As you know, you're the only thing that keeps Matt Chat going. So if you've donated already, thank you very much. If you haven't, or you haven't donated in a long time, uh, please uh, consider dropping a few dollars in the old Matt Chat drinking horn. We'd all really, really appreciate that. Now, you may have wondered where I was last week. I actually got to go to St. Louis, Missouri to present at a conference there. And I got to do some cool stuff, though. I uh, got to uh, sit on the deck of the Star Trek Enterprise, or at least a recreation of it, and uh, take some fun pictures and see all kinds of costumes and stuff like that. So that's where I was last week. Now, what about that ale of the week? Uh, this week, I have a Samuel Smith, uh, not to be confused with Sam Adams brew. This is the India ale. Now, they actually tell the story of what the how the India ales come to be, and you've probably seen these, uh, these sometimes are called India Pale Ales, IPAs, and wondered, uh, you know, what does that mean? Uh, so they explain here that uh, basically to ship the beer or the ale from England to India, they had to put a lot of extra ingredients, a lot of hops in there uh, to keep this uh, from going bad. Um, but as it turns out, uh, people actually developed a taste for this increased uh, hoppiness if you will, and it became a, a popular flavor um, all over the world, not just for the purposes of uh, preservation. So I always thought that was really interesting. But anyway, let's uh, let's open this up and see what uh, she tastes like. There's no uh, there's no cork in this, but there is some foil around the end, so you have to I guess be careful not to get that in the beer. That wouldn't be too nice. Pour it in. Ah. So definitely a little bit of a cherry, sort of a syrupy, sort of an aroma to this. Very pleasant. I like to call it a sort of a floral scent. Definitely kind of a bitter, uh, sweet, sort of that sort of chocolatey, 
uh, taste that you get. Actually, quite a usually IPAs are pretty bitter. Uh, this one is actually not really not not bitter at all. It's more sort of a sweet uh, flavor. Actually, quite good. You know, it almost reminds me of a of a stout. You know, like a Guinness a sort of a quality to it. Very smooth, a uh, nice, a really nice flavor and taste to this. I'm really enjoying this uh, this ale. Highly, highly recommend this. You know, I'm sad to say I don't know what the uh, alcohol content is, but at least it doesn't taste uh, alcohol <laughs> like it has a, a strong alcoholic component. So. Hopefully that would be a good choice for a gaming night. All right, so let's uh, wrap up here as usual with a quotation. And who else but uh, T.S. Eliot, author of The Wasteland. He's got uh, several good quotes, including April is the cruelest month. But I think the quotation that I'll go with is, Humankind cannot take too much reality. See you guys next week.